thought this evening I would uh, talk a little bit about the addictive process and um, how that fits together with uh, dependent origination and this uh, sequence of, uh, say, uh, of uh, mental experiences and uh, how that fits together because um, in the uh, in the, the description of this of uh, the cycle it goes through from uh, the from ignorance at the beginning then the arising of the uh, six senses and sense contact then giving rise to feeling and then feeling conditioning craving craving then conditioning clinging and then clinging conditioning becoming and becoming conditioning birth aging and death sorrow lamentation Pain, grief, and despair. So, kapari deva dukkha dhamana supayasa. Or, um, as uh, one person, one friend of ours in the states used to say, these are a few of my favorite things. <laughs> um, so, uh, the the uh, addictive process is uh, connected to what we do when we meet with dukkha. Uh, as I think I was referring to on the first evening, uh, it's mysterious how this works because uh, when we arrive at a, a, a situation, an experience of, of unhappiness or regret, feelings of incompleteness, so that we've maybe the desire that we followed is to yell at somebody, that we, we, get, we really feel alive when we get angry and vent our spleen, and that, that's how we... Um, we kind of um, feel that's when we feel best <laughs> is when we have a good have a good rant, um, and then you've uh, you've vented your spleen, you've you've uh, yelled at somebody, you've let them know what you think, and then uh, shortly afterwards you feel sokapari deva dukkha domanasu vayasa. That's the feelings of regret and um, uh, the uh, all of the uh, wreckage of the uh, uh, the effects of your words uh, are, is all around you and you realize oh dear I shouldn't have said that or that was that was very hurtful or it wasn't entirely true or um, I said I wasn't going to do this again and so this is the the dukkha experience and you know, characterized in, in the, this term you know, sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair or the uh, other kinds of, of uh, desires or aversions that we follow whatever our particular attachments are, whether it's uh, drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or consuming pastries or uh, seeking uh, uh, approval and affection, uh, being a successful meditator. You know, the, the, as I've said a few times, it's, uh, the, uh, the desire objects or the things that we are addicted to or habituated to are, um, uh, are not always as obvious as, as things like you know, a bottle of drink. <laughs> They can be also uh, social approval, uh, wanting to be the chief merit maker, you know, the, the, you know, the, the the one who is the sort of the big supporter of the temple, who gets you know, gets the front seat because they're the they're the most important person. And, uh, so that uh, when we have followed through a, a desire, uh, uh, whatever it might be, then we can experience this you know, very painful, difficult. Uh, sen- uh, quality of dukkha as this uh, sensations uh, feelings the mood of regret self criticism um, and so then to the rational mind you think well why would you want to do that again <laughs> and we might even be feeling when we so when we uh, arrive at that experience uh, uh, this is awful uh, this is why I said I wasn't going to do this again because this is a dreadful experience and I, and I, I hate this and this is awful. Uh, I never want to do this to myself ever again. This is the the rational mind, the voice of, of reason and clarity is speaking. So, you know, how is it that we find ourselves, um, as David Bowie put it, always crashing the same car? You know, we, we find uh, a while later, you know, we're in exactly the same situation. We've we've uh, we've um, uh, uh, pursued the the same pattern of, of desire. We've we've. Um, yelled at somebody else or we've uh, gone back to the bottle or we've had another smoke or we've um, maneuvered ourselves uh, again into a position of being um, seen as uh, somebody special and you know, the, and important and uh, 
we've fed our own desires for inflation or, or receive or getting uh, affection or or social success or what it, whatever it might be that we're uh, is our drug of choice oh uh, <clears throat> there are different ways that you can look at this and all of our experiences will will be different in various ways but when you um uh, explore this when 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 we look at it the the way that um that this the pattern seems to work is because we're not clear about the experience of dukkha it's painful we feel rattled we're unsettled we're adrift we're lonely we're insecure as a lot of as a lot of me and mine in that so uh we're, we're generally not seeing clearly there's a lot of uh, avijja in the mix, a lot of ignorance, a lot of unclarity in, in the mix. And so um, you know, it's the voice of reason that says, I'm never going to do this again. This is totally pointless. This is really harmful um, you know, physically, emotionally, socially. You know, I, I need to get free of this. Um, but that's not the voice that has the, the power uh, in, uh, in all situations. And so that the the voice of, of reason the voice of wisdom is like the again to get maybe a little bit um neuroscientific that's the voice of the neocortex that's the kind of the the superego that's sort of the the sort of the clear rational uh, thinker but what's driving the uh, the uh, the uh, the force of of uh, craving and compulsion is more the reptile brain uh, down in the the, the non conceptual uh, reactive what, what's called the limbic system the the reactive reptile regions of the brain which is like me i want <laughs> get out of here that's mine yeah and that non-verbal reactive um impulses towards uh, sexual gratification towards uh, ownership of property towards you know, towards aggression fighting off the competition um having getting uh, revenge on those who've who've uh, hurt you or irritated it's uh that uh, aspect of our, our being that reactive instinctual um uh dimension of, of our of our being is what's uh sort of, say, driving the wheel of becoming the bhava chakra that's what causes the the same patterns to repeat themselves so it's it's not reason that makes us follow our our compulsions it's not it, it's not um mostly maybe some of you would disagree with that but generally it's not uh, it's not reason or clarity that's saying yes i'm going to do that again or uh, actually uh, this isn't really harmful and uh, and why not the the thinking mind might be brought in to kind of provide backup if you understand it's like it can be it can be like the kind of guest lawyer to make a case of why it's actually all right to go out and get blasted again or to to um, blast somebody else <laughs> again or to have another smoke but the impulse the, the the sort of the 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 uh the driving force of it is more the um the sort of uh the non-conceptual instinctual sort of reactive element of of our of our nature and so what causes it is because uh and why we get drawn to repeating the same patterns why we keep crashing the same car over and over again we keep repeating the same patterns is uh, uh, because we're in that state uh, of of dukkha, the soka paradeva dukkha domana supayasa. As I said, we're feeling insecure, we're feeling uh, lonely, we're feeling uh, uh, incomplete. We're we, we're um, as definitely an I sense, and that I is not satisfied. That I is is looking for something to make to make that I feel good, to make it feel secure, to make it feel happy, and to feel protected and in that mix of wanting something that will make me feel good um uh, again it's a not is a non-rational thing but what what the, the the mind inclines towards is what uh, what was the thing that made it feel good last time where where did you last feel that sense of yes and uh where we last felt that that uh, that feeling of yes where that where there was a that most sort of substantial experience of gratification was when you had that last drink or when you had that last uh, that last rant or when you had that last uh, uh, sweet and sticky pastry at the pie shop 
you know, whatever it might be, you know, that uh, when you, you got that last um, nod of approval from the Ajahn, he says, well done. <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that hit, that, that charge, was the last time that we felt good. And so, against all reason, then <laughs> the attention goes to, to uh, find a way and the attention moves towards recreating that situation to get that feeling of yes, to get that feeling of gratification once again, even though it's it's going against all the the uh, the assertions the 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 the, the, the voice of reason said i 'm not going to do this again, this is really stupid <laughs> you know this is uh, this is not doing me or anybody any good a uh, 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 counter to all of that. It was. It, it finds a way through. This is my experience <laughs> of how this this works. And then, lo and behold, we've crashed the same car again. We've we've uh, followed that same pattern. We've uh, fallen into that same behavior. And then we're again thinking, "Why did I do this? I wasn't going to do this. How did I end up here again?" But because uh, I think it, if we see how it, it works in this way, and we recognize it's, it's not a rational thing. The mind is just drawn towards the the that which was the last uh, say cause uh, of that that quality of contentment, and so we get we get drawn back into those patterns. And so, um, whatever we've habituated ourselves to, and the, the Buddha pointed this out in in many teachings, what, which, whatever the mind uh, say pays attention to, that will be the inclination that it uh, it shows in the future. So that if we have um, found satisfaction or a thrill or, or, or uh, that quality of, of yes, when we're gambling and we you know, we uh, we win uh, uh, we win at cards or we win on the slot machine, then we're going to be drawn towards the, the gambling. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm not being uh, interested in gambling myself, <laughs> and uh, you kind of I forget that the world of gambling exists. And then like, it was interesting uh, la- last year. Um, um, meeting a, some friend, old, old friends of the monastery, <laughs> and having a chat with them, I suddenly realized, oh, she's got a real gambling thing, <laughs> and how um, uh, just uh, for that particular person has been a, a very sort of committed meditator and 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 a devoted Buddhist for many years. Her mind moves towards you know, finding an excuse to go gambling, and how actually it's all right, <laughs> you know, if you're not, as long as you're not using real money or. It's just sort of a, you're just uh, experimenting, or that you're not really buying shares, and you're just kind of theoretically playing the stock market, <laughs> and uh, as how uh, that uh, you know for that particular person, that's the channel that the mind goes down because there has been this experience of yes, look at that big score, <laughs> and that flush of happiness and and a sense of of being. A sense of identity being affirmed coming from gambling. Now it might be for others of us. It might be uh, it might be alcohol. It might be tobacco. It might be social approval. It might be uh, collecting degrees, you know, learning languages. You know, impressing people the number of languages you can speak, or how many meditation retreats you've done. You know, how many notches you got on your zabuton, you know, at the uh, or uh, how sort of how high up the the monastic hierarchy you are, and you sort of casually mention you know, how many decades you've been in robes. Go, Ooh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever it might be. Uh, as I've said over and over again, we have to sort. Of, I, I would encourage encourage everybody to sort of insert your own particular favored identity here, and it doesn't have to be things that are are, are particularly sort of noble or wholesome. It can be your favored identity as as a complete failure. You know that you're that that's your thing is to be hopeless, you know? and if something threatens your hopelessness, you feel you know, you know how dare you? Yeah, you know, I'm a victim. Do you mind? You know? And seriously, I'm I'm not trying to trivialize that, but we we it's it's important to to look and to see these areas of our life where we do form this this. Uh, the kind of flush of identity in the sense of yes, this is what I am, and, and the things that we keep following that affirm that. Um, 
uh, as I, I mentioned earlier on, I'm, I, I'm trying to keep the focus on on the um, teachings on dependent origination and rebirths of in in terms of our day to day experience, moment to moment, moment to experience, rather than sort of metaphysically across lifetimes. But um, uh, I would like to let people know about this, uh, a particular, very, a very interesting and helpful little book. It's actually written as a uh, uh, a book to, uh, as a children's instructional book about uh, about rebirth, and it's called The Mountains of Tibet. Uh, it's a little, it's a children's picture book, and uh, <clears throat> it's it's very interesting um, because it starts off. Uh, Once upon a time, there was a little boy. Uh, who lived in the mountains of Tibet, and his name was Tenzin, and he used to like to, to walk on the hillside and fly his kite. Okay, nice little story beginning. Turn over the page. Tenzin got old and died. <laughs> oh, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, you're expecting a little bit of plot development. Um, but it was, uh, it was it moved, it, the story moved very, very quickly. So you know, for one minute you've got little Tenzin with his kite on the hillside with his coloured boots, and the next minute Tenzin is this old guy lying on a bed and fading out. But then it says how then you know, as as uh, this person's life was was fading away and the consciousness left the body, then uh, it, uh, the consciousness uh, say dispersed from the from the body and then um, started to. Um, you know, rise into a more kind of spacious and an, an open and um, beautiful realm, and then this, uh, then the consciousness of the of the being that had been Tenzin, then had this experience of uh, of a voice uh, arising either from within, or from within, or from from outside, but it doesn't say, but a voice arising saying, "You have a choice. You can either at this point." Dissolve into the infinity of uh, of the pure light, or if you wish, uh, you can reappear somewhere. What would you like to do? So then, hmm. Well, that pure light sounds kind of attractive, but uh, so what was the other option? Reappearing. Oh. Let let me think about that. And so then they have the next page. You open up. And there's this huge picture of the Milky Way spread across the pages, and so. So, oh well, it's, yeah, kind of, kind of like to to reappear somewhere. Um, how how about somewhere in that little that region, uh, sort of over our, over to the right hand side, near the edge of that big a uh, big collection of stars, and then and then you turn on the page. Oh look, there's there's this beautiful bright yellow star with these like, kind of there's about eight or nine little blobs circling around it. Yeah, that looks kind of interesting. Uh, what what's what's that like over there? And then, Turn the page. Oh, hey, all, the, all these yellow, the, all these these blobs floating around the the big yellow star. The different colours. There's a red one, and there's a really big, you know, cloudy one. There's one with rings around it. And oh, look, there's a little kind of blue green one. The third one out. That looks kind of nice. Well, what's that like? And then, and then turn the next page. And then oh, look, there's. There's all kinds of different sorts of beings down there. You see giraffes and rhinoceroses and whales and fishes and birds and and uh, oh, well, those ones with the kind of the two sticks down below and the kind of lump on top. They look kind of interesting. Yeah. And, uh, I think I might might I, I might like to be one of those. And so we can turn the page and then you see. Once upon a time in in the mountains of Tibet, there was a there was a little girl called Dolma. <laughs> It's the same, you know, the same sort of a silhouette of the little kid on the, on the hillside flying a kite. So uh, I felt this is a, it's a very um, uh, skillful, beautiful little way of describing how, you know, it's not even loves and hates. It's even just that which is familiar to us. We we get drawn back to that because those are the patterns that we follow. Those are the things that, that um, say the mind is conditioned to. Now, when we we consider the um, the things that we are habituated to, whether they they are wholesome or unwholesome or, or neutral, whatever our own uh, addictions might be, uh, our own, uh, so it can be something that's uh, let's say very directly destructive, like 
um, alcohol or, or uh, heroin or tobacco or um, you know, things that are immediately physically harmful or it can be more you know, subtle things, just the, the, the habituation to being a man or being a woman or being British or you know, American or Sri Lankan or Thai. Um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the our affiliation being a Theravadan Buddhist, you know, we can be um, very identified and attached to, um, and you know, habituated to our social roles or our, 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 our nationality, our gender, our position in society. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the the, the things that uh, that's important to recognize is that the things that the, the mind is habituated to, even though those habituations might be extremely strong, might be uh, immensely powerful, and so we might feel like, yeah, this is, a ter- this is an terribly powerful habit. This has been here my entire life. I'm never going to be free of this. I'm completely stuck with this. This is a, uh, an enormously um, strong addiction. You know, that this this uh, identification is is a... Uh, Say immovably uh, present. Even though we might have that thought, and maybe some of us have been struggling with particular issues or, or uh, identity, uh, you know, the, 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 the identification with with our personality or our body or nationality or our, uh, you know, our, and a, a particular substance or drug, you know, whether it's um, you know, something harmful like you know, tobacco or, or um, or whether it's the, um, the the drug of needing to be loved, <laughs> the, the the desire to be approved and, and loved, we might feel as though the the habituation, the addiction, is so strong that we're we, we're never going to be free of it. But um, I, I would like to suggest that it's impossible for us to be helpless victims. That there is always. Uh, uh, the capacity, even though it might be uh, invisible or not apparent, we always have the capacity to uh, to free the heart from that, no matter how strong or deeply rooted that is, because that that habituation, that identity, that that addiction is not who and what we are. That uh, that uh, and in this respect, the, the the teachings of the Buddha on the uh, the qualities of uh, of anicca, dukkha, and, and anatta, uh, of uh, uncertainty or, or transiency, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. That these these three characteristics that uh, all uh, aspects of the world, mental and physical, that uh, the the Buddha pointed that you know, every single thing in the mental world, the physical world, yeah, you know, every single thing. If it's a thing, then it's it's necessarily. Uh, in a state of change, it's necessarily unsatisfactory. That you know, no thing, no event, no experience can permanently satisfy us or be uh, be dependable. And also, there is no thing that can be truly and completely said to be who and what we are. That that can be, in, in any genuine and substantial way, it can't be owned. Uh, it can't be me or mine or, or who and what we are. And so he put this the, these. The, these uh, forward as a way of helping us to investigate experience and to to challenge the the habits of identification that that we create. Um, so I, I can make a sort of, I can make a declaration saying, you know, these these uh, these habits, these uh, of identification, these uh, addictions, these are not who and what we are. These are actually. Um, uh, they are they are necessarily uh, shakeable. We can we can free the heart from them, but uh, rather than just uh, believe me out of hand, uh, it's it's important to see that the the teachings on anicca, dukkha, anatta, they are ways of discovering that or exploring that and and seeing whether that's true for ourselves. And the reflection, particularly on on anatta, is very uh, uh, directly tailored. To help that uh, uh, that to be seen, that no matter how strong a habit might be, no matter how deeply rooted it, it might appear to be, uh, that when we develop the insight into into anatta, 
then we're awakening that realization, that, that clear seeing within the heart that knows, well, this couldn't be who and what I am because nothing is. <laughs> this, this is just a very strong, persistent habit, a very uh, deeply rooted perception of, of uh, that this is me or this is mine or this is what I am, this is my problem. Um, but that is only a, a very strong impression. It, uh, it can't truly be who and what I am uh, because that's uh, there is no thing that that can uh, truly and and realistically be that there's no there's no thing no quality that can be uh, truly and absolutely who and what we are no no particular perception or habit or or identity no thing that is uh, a sankara you know a formation that is absolutely who and what we are and so you can't just uh, hear that thought and then change your, change your, your vision um, you can't just make a habit go away just by understanding oh it's this <laughs> my my smoking habit or my attachment to to um, sexual gratification or my attachment to sugar or my attachment to to social approval that's just oh it's just an empty sankara <laughs> oh okay i'll drop that you know <laughs> again that's just the thinking mind or the rational mind can can see that but it it takes this uh, moment by moment application of uh, of, uh, of wisdom, the development of genuine mindfulness and wisdom, to to be brought to bear like a, a kind of bright, clear light that's that's brought to bear on the those deeply rooted habits that then reveal uh, that that light of wisdom uh, shining on those aspects of our of our uh, our nature of our experience moment by moment you know, day by hour by hour day by day that keeps revealing that uh, and so that it's seen we see for ourselves oh this is not who and what i am this is just a a powerful impulse this is a powerful uh, habit of of identification but it really isn't who and what i am aha and so we keep um uh, by applying the the quality of, of wisdom by uh, training the mind to, to look directly and clearly at experience where we're, we're seeing over and over again and reminding ourselves awakening that insight that genuine intuition in the heart that this is the fact this is the truth and and so that uh, it uh, slowly but surely uh, erodes the the causes for uh, for that that uh, that habit that addiction that, that compulsion to be um, say believed in to be taken to be true and solid and real and absolutely what I am whether the addiction is you know I am you know I am an alcoholic or I am British or you know I am a Theravadan Buddhist or yeah, I am unworthy yeah whatever the I am <laughs> is ta uh, tacked onto what we're we're doing with applying this uh, the the uh, development of vipassana meditation insight meditation the development of wisdom is say uh, not just trying to make ourselves believe that, or just hanging on to a hope, but uh, uh, say, vitalizing um, and strengthening that uh, that uh, clear understanding, that direct seeing, that in the heart which knows. Oh, of course. How could that be? Who and what I am? How could that? It can't be. And uh, giving that uh, support, giving that strength, and giving that. Uh, uh, a uh, say um, more of a um, more say credence, more credibility. Choosing to to let that insight have its voice rather than believing the the habitual judgments of the mind. Our, our habitual judgments will say very easily, "Well, I'm a hopeless victim, <laughs> and I, I, there's no way I can get out of this. You know, this is I'm stuck with this." I'm, I'm uh, I'm helpless in in the grip of this particular habit, this uh, this identification. Some time ago, I was reading about these um, this what they what's called this uh, um, the zombie uh, the the zombie forming fungus. That uh, in uh, certain kinds of ant, these carpenter ants in the tropics, uh, uh, they take in the spores of this particular kind of fungus, 
And then when this fungus enters into the body of the ants, it's a, a particular quirk of evolution. You might wonder what I'm talking about now, but <laughs> stay with me. So there's a particular quirk of evolution. The way that this fungus has developed the capacity to spread itself around, it gets taken into the ants' bodies, and then these ants live up in the, in, in the high branches and in, in the upper story of the, the forest. When the, the ants take in the, the spores of this fungus and the fungus develops inside the, an, the ants' body, then it causes the ants to climb down the trees, down to uh, a few feet above the forest floor level, and then they go out along a branch and they go onto the underside of a leaf, and then they 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 clamp their mandibles into the 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 lowest the underside of the leaf, and then they're frozen there. So this is completely against the will of the ants. They can't. The ant can do nothing about it. They are they become a zombie. So they're, they're they're controlled by the fungus, and then they uh, the, having clamped their mandibles into the bottom of this leaf, they're frozen there, and then. Uh, and this is straight out of the, the, the kind of science fiction movies, then at a certain point this fruiting body of the fungus bursts out of the back of the ant's head. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And then uh, the fruiting body then eventually bursts uh, and releases the spores into the atmosphere. And so that... Uh, <clears throat> and that... Uh, uh, and during that whole process, the ant can do absolutely nothing about it. The ant can't say... Yeah. Well, I don't want to go down the trunk. You know, all my family's up here in the upper branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had enough of this. They can't. They're they're completely compelled to follow the the dictates of the fungus, and that there's they are uh, utterly at the mercy of the um, uh, of this infection that, that causes them to behave in this this uh, strange way. There's there's other, another fungus that actually causes a, a different species of ant. To, to climb out to the edge of, the, of a blade of grass and just sit there until a cow eats it. <laughs> and then it's also developed so that the, uh, it can go through the digestive tract of the cow and then, uh, and then they, the spores arise from the, from the cow dung. So in these situations, you, the, the, uh, the, the ant is completely at the mercy of the, the, um, the effects of this fungus. So... Uh, we might feel that that's what a vijja is like. Ignorance is like we're completely taken over by this compulsion, and we, and we're we're walking like we're going like a sleepwalker, or like the the ant that's been invaded, that we've been carried along. And saying, "I said I wasn't going to do this, and I'm and I'm doing it." <laughs> and even though I said I wasn't going to do it, and I know I'm doing it, I'm still not stopping. <laughs> I'm still doing it, even though I I I'm recognizing that I said I wasn't going to do this, and I'm doing it, and I'm still my feet are not stopping. I'm still moving towards the cookie jar. I'm still <laughs> heading to the heading to the pub, or still angling for for getting that that hit. And so we can have that feeling of like uh, I, I am uh, I'm like a, the zombie ants, completely overtaken by this uh, this uh, terrible. Um, uh, Compulsion, and I, I'm I'm helpless. I'm I, I'm uh, a, a a victim carried along by by the the power of this uh, invader who has turned me into a, a zombie. And even though we might feel like that at times, I would suggest <laughs> that uh, yeah, it's uh, it's most important to to recognize that's never really the case. Yeah, we are not ants. <laughs> we have capacities that are, are are far greater. And even though there might be a, a very powerful current um, in in any circumstance, there is there is a a, um, a, a dimension of our, our being. There is that quality of of mindfulness and wisdom that we can draw upon, even when that compulsion can seem to be absolutely unstoppable, or like that where there's there's nothing within our power to to break the strength of that, uh, I would suggest one of the things that is most helpful to to um, to draw upon from a retreat or not a situation like this is to to say, deeply etch that into our our, our consciousness, our, our attitude that we are never a victim. Though as human beings, we have we have tremendous resources, we have capacities, and even though um, Things might uh, tell us, or that our thoughts might say, uh, "You know, I have no power to 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 resist this." I would say, "Yes, we do. 
we do and uh, that uh, but it's the 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 difficult thing as m most of us probably recognize is learning to listen to that voice that says yes <laughs> yes we do we ha we have a choice here because part of us actually enjoys uh, the you know being carried along enjoys being a victim enjoys sort of saying oh it's, it's out of my hands i don't have i have no i have no power here some strange element of our being uh, likes that our ajahn Chah once said um uh, until we really know the the pain of attachment we won't let go <laughs> Reason won't cause us to let go. Uh, good advice from our friends won't cause us to let go. Usually, uh, the, the the main thing that causes us to let go is pain. <laughs> Ow! When we realize this really hurts, or uh, and that uh, when we recognize the the pain of attachment, then that that is what really impels us to say. Uh, to listen to that voice that says, you know, I don't have to do this, or like, no, I'm tired of this. I'm really tired. I just, I'm, I'm ready to drop this because that, that sense of, of uh, burdenedness, that sense of, of, of pain and tension in the heart, something that the voice of wisdom manages to, 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 uh, to come through and say, enough. And one of the the, um, the the very helpful teachings of the Buddha in this respect, addressing this area, area, he said, suffering ripens in one of two ways. Again, it's kind of referring to what I've been saying this evening. Is uh, it says suffering either ripens in further suffering, like the dukkha becomes a cause for, for further dukkha, that that suffering causes us to get caught up in desire and then following the same patterns of gratification and identification or it ripens in search so either you keep the uh, going around and around the wheel of becoming uh, caught up in the same uh, cycles of compulsive uh, habits and identification or it results in search and the, the search means that voice in the, of wisdom that says there must be a way out of this. <laughs> I'm really tired of being trapped in this cycle of being constantly drawn towards you know, attractive people or towards gambling opportunities or towards you know, looking for social approval or looking or, or looking for the next new pie shop, you know, whatever it might be. That uh, that uh, <clears throat> that in the heart that that recognizes. I don't have to be a, a, a victim here. I don't have to go along with this. It is possible. So like that 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 uh, intuition in your heart that knows it is possible to be free of this, to to not be caught up in this. And there's got to be a way. So that search is searching for the way. <laughs> what that way is to 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 free the heart from that. And in one of the expressions or the, the Buddha's descriptions of Paticca Samuppada, there's a very unique, um, uh, say, uh, recension of it, and he describes how the, how this works, he, he, and and that uh, rather than than the dukkha being a cause for, for further dukkha, then at the end of, of the, the the cycle when it goes. Um, you know, uh, say clinging leads to to becoming, becoming leads to birth, birth leads to aging, sickness and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair towards dukkha. Then straight after uh, dukkha having been caused, then uh, the Buddha says that dukkha gives rise to faith, and then faith gives rise to to joy, and that faith uh, is arising because the, the in that res, in that respect, it's dukkha is a cause for faith. Because there's enough of that quality of wisdom that, that is that is saying there's got to be a way out, that that dukkha is is being, say, reflected upon. So rather than the dukkha being wallowed in, like poor me, or how can I, I can't stand this, or I think I need I need another, another tub of ice cream, or <laughs> I need a smoke, that uh, that the uh, dukkha is not being wallowed in or believed in, but it's being reflected upon. It's at that moment there's this 
oh no, here I am again. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, a, yeah, I've had enough of this. So that, that dukkha being the cause for faith is that the faith that there's got to be an alternative. I know the heart can be freed of this. And, uh, and then, following upon that arising of faith, of sadha, there comes the, the pomojo, joy that, yeah, right. <laughs> like the, as soon as that's, that's given some credence, as soon as that, that, uh, that intuition is, say, um, uh, is followed or allowed to, to have its effect, again, there's the, the, the wisdom aspect of our nature says, yeah, that's right. And that's, that's, that's a really, that's really good news. And, and then with the arising of that that sense of, of delight, there's a, a relaxation of body and mind, like what's called kaya samati, and then that leads towards contentment. Contentment then leads to um, the quality of samadhi, a concentration, and samadhi leads to uh, insight into the uh, way things are, knowledge and vision of the way things are. That insight then leads to, to liberation. So in that that particular recension of uh, Paticca Samuppada, then right from from dukkha, rather than that just causing the you know more and more trips around the wheel, that 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 suffering, is a, a the cause of of faith, and then leading uh, to the uh, exit from uh, you know, the from the whole cycle, freeing the heart from those cycles of compulsive uh, identification and compulsive behaviors. So in this respect, um, we can we sort of put the, the put the dukkha to work. <laughs> that uh, that, that uh, in that respect, uh, is allowing into the to the heart the, the 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 painfulness of what we've caused through our identification, through that um, through follow, following particular habits. So in a way, what benefits us is sort of is letting ourselves truly feel the painfulness of of what we've what we've caused through our action through our attitude through following that habit so um, when we experience that kind of distressed lonely incomplete frazzled sokapari deva dukkha dominasa upayasa feeling rather than than seeking to get away from that uh, and this is this is kind of counterintuitive rather than just following the habits of one need to just fill up that space with with something that's pleasing or gratifying or just take me take the attention away from this instead uh the encouragement is to really let it in to just to let let the 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 results of that action or that attitude be fully known to to let yourself really feel ow <laughs> this this is this is really painful like this is really difficult and then uh, in that really uh, uh, opening to that the painfulness of it, that's in a mysterious way what helps the the habit to be broken. That's what helps the the uh, the, the causes of the of the the habits to to dissolve and strengthens the the wisdom faculty, strengthens that clarity of mind that that intuits that uh, we don't have to be caught up in this. We don't have to to be tied to this. This is not something that's absolutely immovable. Now, as we've all probably realized or experienced, it's not just a matter of seeing this once and then, okay, now I've got it. <laughs> we see it works that way and then... Um, you know the uh, the the uh, destructive habits, the the um, patterns of identification are just popped like a bubble forever. It does uh, most of us will realize it doesn't quite work that way, um, and that uh, your know, habits are hard to to break, and so that um, uh, we have and uh, it's uh, maybe we are able to see. Yes, this is destructive. This is painful. Yes, there is a, a way out of it, and yes, I, I, I can see that um, this is possible. But yet, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a, a lot of momentum there, and uh, also it might be that we just don't even recognize it, how these patterns work. Um, 
and that uh, <clears throat> but what we uh, what we can do is uh, at least we can substitute when we uh, when, when we're trying to, to to break free or, or free the heart from these destructive habits we can substitute a, a more uh, benign or wholesome obsession <laughs> for the the more destructive ones and uh, that and this is not um, a, a sign of, of weakness but it, it's more of a, uh, a pragmatism a pragmatic way and this is you know the Buddha also um, yeah, acknowledged this or, or talked about this in terms of training the mind uh, when it's caught up in, in destructive and unwholesome habits that you you uh, you, you take an unskillful object and, and you uh, and, uh, substitute it with uh, a more skillful, more wholesome object for the mind to be obsessed with. If you're going to be obsessed with something, you know, at least you you, you uh, give it something, give the mind something to chew on, but just give it something that's a little bit more wholesome. And uh, so the Buddha talked about this in terms of uh, of um, dealing with distracted thoughts. Like the mind is is uh, say obsessing on some kind of desire object. Will you give it something else to obsess on, but something that's a bit, little bit more have a wholesome or, or, or beneficial um, now this is a a, a, um, a simple tactic and you, you know we might think the idealist within us might, might say well you know you should just sort of stop it altogether that you should just break your break your bad habits and just and stop but that that's not uh, how we function as human beings it's not so easy for us to do that and I was <coughs> living in in uh, in America for a long time, and I got to, to know quite a lot of people uh, involved in the twelve-step programs. And it struck me uh, meeting people who were, uh, mostly had uh, alcohol or drug addiction um, uh, in their past that they tended to smoke a lot of cigarettes, and the ones who and drink a lot of coffee are the ones who'd stopped smoking and drank a, you know, an awful lot of coffee. <laughs> and then the 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 <clears throat> And the uh, the ethic within that group was it was it was understood quite uh, quite practically that it was uh, compared to to being drunk all the time or to having a a, a, a drinking problem that you, know, you couldn't stop uh, consuming alcohol you know, most of every day. It was far better to at least be smoking a few cigarettes. You know, the, the, okay, it was destructive, but at least you weren't you weren't out of your mind. You weren't drunk and, and incapable, and then. And then uh, slowly, uh, then you could wean yourself off the cigarettes, and then, and then slowly wean yourself off the the coffee. I noticed even the ones who were taking themselves off the coffee, they drank an awful lot of chamomile tea or <laughs> Roybosch tea. There were kind of pints of pints of decaf tea were going down. But I could relate to that. You know, I, I was also I was a um, a heavy drinker as a teenager, and uh, one of the reasons why I was. Uh, I got to know a lot of the the people in twelve step programs that uh, how uh, for myself my my own kind of history was uh, was thoroughly involved in that and my in my family I, I can't uh, not the, my, my whole family were drinkers but <laughs> I had I was given my own beer mug when I was six <laughs> I kid you not and uh, a small one it was a, I had my own. I came from a family that uh, didn't shy away from that. And, so, and the Sunday lunch, I get an inch of beer in the bottom of my beer mug. And, and my father's logic was, you know, he's got to start sometime. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I started drinking alcohol at the age of six. So by the time I was 15 or 16, you know, I was drinking a lot. But at that, at that point, it was, you know, it was all kind of uh, all uh, part of the the kind of fun of being a, a reckless teenager and so that was uh, something that uh, was just sort of part of what everybody was doing that I was uh, living with people I was at school with and people I, I hung out with and it was uh, it was that was all well and good but then by the time I was 20 uh, then I wasn't drinking just for 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 fun but I, I was I found I was more just drinking to to forget to, to not feel to sort of wipe out the feelings of, of dukkha, and uh, I didn't really realize what was what was happening because it was you know, I, w I was not amongst a particularly abstemious crowd, <laughs> and everybody was uh, 
generally uh, partying, the kind of people that I was at college with or friends from where I grew up in Kent. And um, and it, it was uh, it was only one one day, and I was in the the local pub. Uh, it was it's a small village in Kent, and it was a Tuesday lunchtime, and there was only three of us in the pub. And um, it was a, a friend of mine who was um, a uh, she, she was a kind of party animal herself, so she wasn't wasn't a kind of straight laced, abstemious type at all. And uh, she uh, wanted me to meet this friend of hers who was um, had come down from the north of England. And uh, we'd been sitting in the pub for about an hour and a half or so. And uh, she ca she just casually said, why are you drinking so much? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you're, you're on your eighth pint. <laughs> and I said, so? And she said, well, we're just sitting here, the three of us having a conversation. It's a, it's a Tuesday lunchtime. You know, we're not in the middle of a party. You know, so how come you're drinking so much? Uh, and, <clears throat> and, so then, and then she made the fateful comment, what are you afraid of? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a very powerful statement and a very powerful comment because up to that point, I'd never really hadn't really noticed that my drinking was increasing to the point where I was uh, kind of falling down drunk four or five nights a week. Fortunately, I was very poor, <laughs> so I, my budget limited the amount of boozing I could actually do. But this comment from this friend who was not trying to be critical or not sort of trying to put me on the spot, she was not a, a kind of teetotaler herself by any means, but she was just sort of curious. You know, why are you doing this to yourself? Where's this coming from? And uh, and also pinpointing that you must be afraid of something. You, you must be trying to not feel, because otherwise you wouldn't be you wouldn't be sinking a gallon of beer on a Tuesday lunchtime. And uh, and because she, uh, the the comment came from a very sort of open and friendly uh, place from her, she wasn't being accusatory. It was just so. Sort of, well, this is kind of strange. Why are you doing this? And that it really <laughs> got straight through, and I couldn't forget, even though I was drunk at the time. You know, I couldn't forget what she'd said, and this comment of "What are you afraid of?" and that just hovered there, and I realized that's right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm drinking just to stop feeling. I'm afraid of of um, these feelings of so insecurity and unhappiness, and and uh, that's that's where this is coming from. So that that caused me to decide um, to for my twenty first birthday present to myself to stop drinking. And at the time, I didn't realize I was going to be living the, for, for the rest of my life in a Buddhist monastery. Uh, that was not on my program at the time. Um, and the reason why I'm telling this story is because uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, I, you know, I decided to stop drinking because I realized well. Better than just hiding away from these feelings, it's much better to 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 sort of turn and face it to to meet you know what is the the, the cause of these kind of feelings of insecurity. Far better to to turn towards it and uh, and look at it. Uh, I didn't really know how to do that, but I knew it was. I suspected that was a a, a good thing to do, and uh, and so then um, uh, a few months later. Uh, so I, I left England just after my 21st birthday in September of 77. And then in January of 78, I was in the monastery in Thailand. So just about four months later, without really planning that. So then it was uh, living in a Buddhist monastery is a really great way to stop drinking. Because <laughs> there's no booze around. No one is around you is drinking. And, there's, and it's completely verboten. And you've got no money. So... <laughs> So it was a really great way to support my resolution, and I suspect if I wasn't living in a monastery, my resolution wouldn't have lasted quite so, quite so strongly. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but it was uh, what was kind of interesting was that whereas uh, when I was uh, before I went into the monastery, I could see that I was uh, drinking so much and, and getting getting blasted. So because I was, I was trying to be the sort of the most um, um, the, 
uh, the most sort of extreme, one of the most sort of comprehensive party goer, the kind of, uh, and that uh, I was doing the 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 sort of the um, the the inebriation thing to the most extreme level possible. I got into the monastery. I, I realized uh, after a while that I was doing the 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 monastic thing to the most extreme level possible. <laughs> So where and and apparently this is exactly the same thing happens in the Christian monasteries. They say the the people who used to to drink everybody under the table before they came in the monastery they fast everybody under the table <laughs> once they they become monks. And uh, I heard this comment you know, many years later, and I said, "Yeah, that's right," <laughs> because uh, you know my my uh, my. Uh, Habit then, trying to, as I became a monk, was to sort of to out monk. You know, well, I was, before I was trying to out drink everybody. <laughs> then I got in the monastery, I was trying to out monk everybody. <laughs> so I was sort of carrying out, full, carrying on out, out all these uh, ascetic practices and following all these sort of extra uh, austere observances. And it was uh, it was not until um, a couple of years later that I realised that I'd sort of substituted. The, the the wholesome habits of monking, <laughs> and you're know, sitting up all night, uh, or uh, meditating, or just eating you know, strictly one meal a day, or, or only ever eating the food out of my arms bowl, or, or you know, forever patching my robes. I, like my robes are like three or four layers thick of patches, you know. <laughs> that uh, <clears throat> and this sort of trying to to be a kind of super monk. They're trying to you know out uh, the, uh, my my kind of um, compulsiveness. I just sort of chosen a, a different object, and uh, I didn't really notice that this was happening until that I was, I sort of fixated and, uh, and uh, was trying to, you know, anyway, for forming an identity around this. Until one day, Lumpur Sumedha gave me a medal. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. There was this kind of, it was like a. a, a a medallion, like a little a Buddhist medallion. It looked just like a medal. Had like a little sort of. It was it was it was bronze, and it had a little bar across the top, and then a sort of uh, and then a diamond shaped um, medallion with the Buddha's face on it. And it, so it looked just like a kind of military medal. And then Lumpur kind of gave it to me. and said, "Here's a medal for you, venerable. Yeah, yeah. To be the kind of champion monk." And at the time, I was still so absorbed in trying to trying to out monk everybody. I thought, "Oh, great!" You know. <laughs> he recognizes how how how, uh, how special I am. <laughs> and uh, so, but you know, uh, it was a, it was funny in its own way. And in retrospect, I can, I began to see what was happening. But uh, it was, I think, that's important to see that uh, even though I was kind of obsessed with trying to you know, and taking the monastic life and its traditions and practices, I was um, had sort of substituted that for getting loaded on, on alcohol and, and drugs. But um, it was a much more wholesome set of objects, <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, it was rather like substituting the cigarettes for the alcohol and then the coffee for the cigarettes and then the Roy Bosch tea for the coffee. <laughs> That uh, that yes, you know, I was I did get totally lost in trying to uh, to sort of out monk everyone, but um, at least there was much less damage being caused along the way, and so that when we see that we we have particular obsessions or, or addictions compulsions, then um, this process of substitution and uh, substituting a wholesome object for an unwholesome one is not to be sneezed at. It's my experience of, of, of that is really, uh, yeah. The, the the Buddha was incredibly wise and very very practical. He saw how this works, and that um, slowly but surely you can you you get to recognize the patterns, and that the, you use more and more benign and wholesome um, benevolent objects until finally you you are able to free the heart from that kind of compulsiveness. as habits altogether. Maybe just a last little story on this this vein to. Uh, no pun intended. Um, it was about Lenny Bruce, um, and uh, this is a, a story Peter Cook of uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore told. And uh, so, uh, back in the uh, in the distant past, in the uh, late fifties or early sixties, Peter Cook uh, was at Cambridge University, and he helped to to run the, the Footlights um, sort of comedy review, this sort of little um, comedy troupe of, of Cambridge students. 
And the Footlights review people, they decided that they were, they were going to do something very extravagant and they invited Lenny Bruce, a uh, comedian, to come over from New York uh, to, to do a performance, to do some performances in Britain. And Lenny Bruce was, was uh, famous for his uh, uh, sort of sta- being a stand up comic, but also very edgy. <laughs> and also, he was um, uh, a, a, a very liberal user of drugs and alcohol. And so um, Peter Cook described how they, well, you know, he went to the airport and welcomed him off the plane and I thought, oh, very, very glad to see you, Mr. Bruce. I hope that your journey's been okay and, uh, and the, anything that we can do for you while you're here, you know, please just say. He says, oh, sure, yeah. You got any heroin? <laughs> <laughs> so Peter Cook is kind of, um, well, 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 I'm, I'm so, well, yeah, sorry, um, well, I'll see what I can do. And, so he's uh, he's thrown into this tizzy like oh my goodness heroin this is that's dangerous, you know, and where am I and that's illegal and where am I going to get any? So he thought he thought um, Dudley Dudley yeah he's a musician he was a music scholar at Oxford you know so he said Dudley he's a musician he he's bound to know some of these kind of jazz types and they they use all these drugs and so then he told this hilarious story of him and Dudley Moore to, trying to to search out some heroin and he said and Dudley said well I've got some junior disprin <laughs> you know <laughs> will that do <laughs> so uh, anyway they go into a tizzy trying to do, with all their, their their musical friends and such like and they 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 are totally uh, are unable to come up with any uh, any of the any heroin for for Lenny Bruce and then Peter Hook describes sort of going back to him at this this um the, the uh, <clears throat> they take him to this guest house in, in Cambridge later in the evening. So I'm oh, terribly sorry, Mr. Bruce. You know, we tried really hard, but, uh, you know, um, we, we, you know we, 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 we realize this will be very important for you, but, you know, sorry, we, we couldn't find any heroin. He says, well, never mind. You got any chocolate cake instead? <laughs> so, that uh, he was quite happy with, with chocolate cake as a substitute. <laughs> So that uh, you know, that uh, stuck in my mind as an interesting little tale, and that uh, how um, the um, uh, when we are in that kind of a situation and we find ourselves sort of pulled uh, by our particular craving or our, our, our personal obsession, then um, to see that well, what can I you know, what can I substitute? this for or, or can I find an alternative yes I'm chasing after this or I'm you know, I'm caught up in this this desire or this this um uh say compulsion or I, I'm feeling really upset about this or or, or or obsessed with that just to consider well maybe I can maybe I can think of a substitute maybe I can find something just to sort of put in place of that and just like you know Lenny Bruce was quite happy with a slice of chocolate cake rather than a fix of heroin you know, I'm not uh, trying to trivialize that uh, because I know that you know, these are extremely painful and serious issues uh, as well. But also, just uh, the, the kind of matter of factness, <laughs> like oh, oh well, got any cake? You know, <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's it it, it uh, it's that uh, flexible. You know, that, that it doesn't. It, we are actually um, say. Uh, able to find a, a sense of a contentment or a, that we are you know we find yeah a piece of cake would do instead or you know, why not just have a you know have a cup of of a herb tea instead of the the the, the other drug of choice that uh, yeah that would do fine and that uh, just giving ourselves the space to to leave aside the the, the usual and uh, obsession and just uh, substitute it with something uh, much more benign, such something much uh, easier and milder. Then we can no- and then notice. Oh, look! Actually, this is fine. <laughs> this is. I'm. I'm quite content. Everything. The world is is absolutely okay uh, with this. Instead, aha! Look at that. I didn't really need it. Just as I, I was saying on the first evening, I had that insight about the pineapple. I didn't get the pineapple, and nothing is missing. So uh, uh, this is a, a, a very helpful thing to keep reminding ourselves. Just when we substitute um, uh, an object of craving or desire or aversion, that uh, you know, like if you're really upset with somebody and you really want to let them have it, take it out on your pillow. <laughs> 
write that, that write the email that you really want to say. You really let them have it, and then don't send. You know this. <laughs> Just the, these simple ways of, of creating a, a little kind of diversion where you you are uh, able to in a sense give the give the craving or give the the impulse uh, something to chew on, but uh, you help it to be more uh, to steer it towards something that's that's blameless, that's harmless, that's benign, and and look at that oh you, know, you feel much better having written the email and then really glad that you didn't send it. <laughs> So there's a, a, a few things to chew on for the evening, so uh, please uh, take these uh, thoughts and reflect if you wish. <laughs>